uh, kia ora everybody, um, it's, it's, uh, it's really cool to be here today because um, for me reggae music is about kaupapa Māori, the two go hand in hand and I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> how they do that and how, they, how, how it's done that for me over the past 20, 25 years of, of playing music. Um, I started with a band called Aotearoa, <laughs> um, which was an interesting band at its time because I think it scared the crap out of the establishment to some, to some extent because the messages that we had in our songs were so direct. We weren't telling anybody how to live, we weren't telling anybody how to be, but we were going to hui, and we were recording what was being said in these, in these hui, and putting them into our songs, or I was anyway. And um, I think the most um, popular and famous of those songs, if you could call it that, was a song called Marana Ke Ai, which is written by the guy in the overalls. That guy is now a high court judge, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and, and a fantastic frontman, a fantastic composer and orator and all the rest of it, and he's turned out to be a very, very conservative um, uh, judge. <laughs> so, um, former head of the, um, I, think he was the I think he was the, uh, the head judge in, or whatever it is, the top judge, whatever they call them, in the Māori Land Court, and he moved into the High Court in the last three years. So it's really, really interesting to see where these people have gone. This woman over here, was the toughest person in the band, you didn't, you didn't pick a fight with her, that's Ngā Pera Hoerera. Um, and she now is, I think, firmly ensconced at the Puni Kōkiri as a public servant. Um, <clears throat> this guy here, you can see there's a really young fellow at the back here. That's now Marka McGregor. Some of you might know Marka, but he's standing behind the guy with the overalls. <coughs> Marka was 14 at the time. This was taken in 1985-86 at the Greyland Festival. And um, the reason I put it up here is because it's got a really, really interesting story. Marco was 14, we had to carry, we had to hide him away when we walked into gigs, otherwise he got kicked out by the bouncers, because he, he basically grew the mo to look a bit older. Um, so it was like Justin Bieber with a mo. <laughs> um, this guy over here, the, the, playing the bass in the glasses, he was only 16 at the time. And between the two of them, I had my, well, actually, and this third guy over here, he was 15, his name was Solomon Simmons. And my mission in life was to look after them, make sure they didn't get into any trouble because their parents were going to kick my ass when I got home. <laughs> so they had, um, so it was a really, really interesting band. And, and, you know, so we've got those three guys there. Marka, I think, of the three, has gone on to do some really interesting things. And he's taken the Kaupapa of Māori platform that we laid in that band and kind of put it into his music, which I, I really enjoy. Um, <clears throat> Lucy Fully's in the middle there. I don't know what's, what's happened to Lucy. And the guy at the back is um, Samoan uh, Ngāpuhi, his name is Taifui Māono, uh, one of the Kārina family from up north. But at this particular gig, we also had a, um, <clears throat> a fourth member, uh, another member, who you can see just behind me, with my flash Yamaha guitar. And that was our manager. His name was Hemi Horn, and that was the, the first and only gig he ever played with us. And we had a guy called Charles Royal, who's a well-known academic now, playing keyboards. But he and I were having a bit of a thing, so he didn't turn up to teach me a lesson, right? And um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the manager was a bit of a, you know, he's a nice keyboard player. Except when you put him in front of a crowd, then he just turned to crap and just, just melted. And so the whole time behind me I've got this, what's the song? What's the chords? What's the chords? You're freaking me out. And his hands are like this, he can't play. I'll tell you what, man, I was just about to turn around with a guitar and go, bang! Because... He annoyed me for the first three songs, that's all I heard. You're freaking me out, what's the chords, what's the song? <laughs> and I, I just um, motioned to the guy on the desk to pull his channel out, and we just played, you know, and I just laughed the whole way through it. But added to that was we were supposed to play second to last before the party at Māori Club, and there was like about 10,000 people there, right? Delvanius at the last minute, as Delvanius does, said, no, no, we're going to play second last, you guys are going to finish, right? So the party at Māori Club goes on for an hour, when they finish, everybody thinks it's over. So the huge crowd that was there turns into these 10 people sitting here. <laughs> so yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting day. So that, you know, they say a picture says a thousand words. I think this one says 10, at least 10,000. But it was an interesting time. 
And it was a time, I suppose, when we as a band, <clears throat> when I think the kaupapa Māori, or, or our, our kaupapa, actually um, was more important to us than the music. The music came, became really, really important after a few, you know, sort of um, reviews of our live gigs, then we started to get a bit worried. And a disastrous performance on, um, on radio with pictures, <laughs> which came back to haunt us a few times. So the band, within the next couple of years, became, you know, a lot tighter and put more, you know, placed more importance on, on being musicians. I want to go through Kaupapa Māori because Kaupapa Māori is a really, really interesting thing. I mean, it's, and it's wider ranging than this. This is an academic's perspective of what Kaupapa Māori is. And this incorporates the views of um, Graham Smith, who is the CEO of Te Wānanga Wāwanui Arangi, and Liani Pihama. And uh, you can see the principles there. The first one, I think, one of the most important um, tenets of Kaupapa Māori is the principle of self-determination and empowerment. So for us, our music was about empowering our people. But it wasn't about empowering them, saying to them, look, you get up and you kill everybody, you can see that isn't brown. It was about um, <clears throat> starting to strengthen yourself from within, understanding who you are, what your history is about, and, um, and the things that you would like to be, and realising those things. But also understanding that there was a history here in, in Aotearoa that led to you being in the situation that you're in. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first thing, the principle of self-determination, the, the, the principle of empowering not only Māori individuals, but Māori whānau and communities as well. The next one, Taonga Tukuihu, the principle of cultural aspiration. And for some of us, Taonga Tukuihu is, is about inheritance. It's about the things that you receive, not just the material things, but the, the things you receive for your whakapapa, your wairua, um, your DNA, I suppose, your characteristics, the things that make you who you are. And generally, it's a sharing of your two parents. But you see, but then those, the two parents before you also shared something from their parents as well. So a whole lot of things coming down through that whakapapa and you carrying those things on. Um, <clears throat> but this also assumes that Māori ways of knowing, doing and understanding the world are considered, considered valid, are valid in this particular, from this particular framework. There is no justifying them, there's no, um, there's no having to explain what you're doing, they just are. They have their own mana. Ako Māori. Now this is the principle of culturally preferred pedagogy, which means that, um, <clears throat> that Māori ways of teaching and understanding things and learning are accepted. They're not questioned, they're accepted, that's the way they're done. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's a really, really important thing because teaching, teaching and learning is the same word in Māori, ako. Three, three letters, ako. A-K-O, ako. It means to learn and to teach. And what it means is that if I'm a teacher in front of a class, I'm not filling, you know, 20 empty vessels with all this, you know, this um, sacred knowledge that I have. What I'm actually doing is, yeah, I'm giving some, but I'm getting some too. You know what I mean? So the, the whole process of teaching and learning isn't about one person knowing everything. It's actually about everybody having their own mana, their own particular um, skills and knowledge. And then the teacher becomes almost a, a facilitator in a way. Uh, facilitating knowledge, you know, the flow of knowledge between themselves and the, and the learners but then also recognising that there is knowledge resident within those learners and utilising that and getting that flow going so that everybody in the class benefits from what everybody knows. So that's, that's ako. This one here, kia pikiaki ngā riririrua, the kind of the principle of socio-economic mediation. Those are, big, those are big words, and I had a few problems getting them out, and I'm not talking about the Māori ones. Um, <clears throat> but basically what it is, is that there are lots of Māori who live in communities that are, that are economically and socially depressed. And I lived in that one of those, I was brought up in one of those communities, and it was a nice community when I was a kid. But when I went back there after, after I finished at university, to pay my dues, and, and, and that's exactly what it was, because my, my grandfather said to me, boy, when you finish doing what you're doing at university, when you get your qualifications, you come home and you help us out. Um, and he was 15 years gone when, by the time I'd gotten back. But the, the thing about it was that it was part of, of me and saying thank you to the community and giving back to that community who had helped me um, to get where I've gotten to. And I, I keep saying to my children, you know, if it wasn't for my mother, who was a, the original solo mum with ten children, who put everything into getting her children educated, and, and in both ways too, in a Māori way and in a, in, a, in, a, in a mainstream way, in a Pākehā way. So she wanted us to have that balance so that we could get through things. And, um, you know, and my children now uh, are happily middle class, you know. And I keep saying to them, you're here in this nice house because 
this little lady here who was about that tall did all that work for your dad, you know? So it's about recognising those things and going back. And this principle refers to assisting those communities to be empowered, to become, to get to the point where they're not reliant on, you know, on, on government assistance or aid. Because that's really what this first one at the top, Tenuranga Tiritanga, is about. It's about standing on your own two feet. I think whānau is pretty, you know, is, is pretty much self-explanatory. It's the, it's understanding that, yeah, whānau is about, it's not just about two parents and the children that follow, but it's also about generations before that. It's also about, you know, first cousins and, and it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wide principle. It can also be applied to a group of people with a common objective. You know, I, I love that word whānau. Kaupapa, the principle of collective philosophy, and this is another thing too, this is, one of those things about everybody having a collective vision. It might be slightly different, and, and the ways and means of getting to the, to the, you know, of achieving the end may be slightly different, but everybody, um, you know, believes that the, this is what we're all trying to achieve. And at, at certain times you'll get together and you'll say, okay, we will um, coordinate our efforts here and there. Um, <clears throat> and believe me, it's very, very hard to get a group of people going in the same direction. Um, they might be going for the same things, but they've got different ways of getting there. And it's important that that's recognised too, that you don't turn around to people and say, no, that's wrong, otherwise they'll give you the two fingers and you're left doing things on your own. The Treaty of Waitangi. The, the, the Treaty of Waitangi <coughs> really is the interface for a lot of Māori groups. It's their terms of reference. It's the terms of reference um, for their legal struggle. It's their terms of reference for their <coughs> cultural struggle as well. Um, so if you ignore the Treaty of Waitangi when you're dealing with Māori groups, then you're, you're actually going to get yourself into trouble. Uh, and I know that it's a scary thing, you know. The treaty scares a lot of non-Māori people, but that's only because they don't know what it actually means. And, um, you know, and, and one of the, I think the, the criminal things at the moment is that not, not more effort is going in to educate our people, you know, everybody in our country about the Treaty of Waitangi. Because I'm so tired of going onto websites and stuff, oh, these Māori's getting all this money. You know, and I have to resist the temptation of trying to answer every piece of crap that I see on those websites, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I move off that and pretend I'm blind. Um, and this final one here is, is ata. It's written as ata, but it's ata. And the word ata in Māori, ata haere, ata whakarongo, ata kōrero, means to be careful, to be considered in what you do. And I think that's really, really important. I think um, <clears throat> some of my brothers and sisters don't, don't practice that. They go rushing in. And then later on realise, oh crap, you know, I've created more damage than, you know, than anything else. So I think that, that principle is a great one as well. So that's, that's an academic view of kaupapa Māori. And in short for us, kaupapa Māori was about practising all of those things. It was about practising being fun. I remember we played at Waikato University in about 88 or 89. And, the, um, and this was at the orientation gig they had there. And... <clears throat> I overheard the, the orientation coordinator complaining about why is it this bloody hotel group is on last, you know, why, why should they be on last, you know? Surely Sneaky Feelings, who is a, um, <clears throat> a flying nun group, should be last. And um, at that time, and I think it was just before you joined the band, were you? Mm -hmm. We had um, one of Mania Puzzle Jackson out the front, met at Boynton, um, it was a big band and we were, we were cooking, you know, we'd finally got to where I wanted the band to be. And so I thought, oh, it's okay. Then the flying nun guys turn up, right? <clears throat> and they're all these skinny white fellas. They look like they haven't had been paid for you know, for a couple of months. They all look really hungry and they've got no roadies. And these little wee guys trying to lift these big amps. So I walk over to the guy I thought was the leader and I say, hey, bro, do you want a hand? I said, what do you mean? I said, you know, guys will come and blow your gear out. So out jump these beefy brown boys, you know, and carry all this gear inside. And then later on, we're sitting down to eat and somebody's gone downtown and got a big pile of fish and chips, right? And these poor guys are sitting over there with nothing to eat. So they said, hey, we can't eat in front of those fellas. Look, they've got nothing to eat. So we went and we got them and they came and ate with us. And it was really interesting. During that quarter that we had, they said to me, oh, hey, we thought you guys were really aggressive. I said, what do you mean? Well, yeah, they all reckon you guys are anti-white and all the rest of it. I said, no, 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 no. That's just the press break, you know. Um, but it was our way of, of expressing our kaupapa Māori by saying to them, this is our gig. It's not just Aotearoa's gig because we're headlining. It's everybody's gig.